we turned it around and said, well, we've got manufacturing business, we've got a team of engineers, physicists, designers, mechanical engineers. How can we grow value in the business without revenue? Yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Dave Hughes, and I'm the founder and CEO of Novasound, a Scottish sensors company. Perfect. And, and what, do you, what do you do with sensors? Give us a bit more of a background on the business itself. So, so we sell advanced ultrasound sensors and ultrasound everybody knows from the hospitals. And uh, we have some healthcare activities, but mainly we're selling into the oil, gas and aerospace uh, industries where they use ultrasound to look inside objects, detect corrosion, cracks, defects, keeping uh, air passenger safety at its highest point. That's what we do at Novasound. So it sounds like you work within a range of sectors with the product you've actually got. So, so how does that differ sector to, to sector, say when you're working with health or when you're working with oil and gas? Yeah, so at the heart of Novasound, we've got a platform technology. Ultrasound is ultrasound effectively. And uh, basically the big change is the commercial side of it, how, how you sell into aviation versus oil and gas versus mm-hmm. healthcare. They're all very highly regulated markets. But if the core technology underlying is the same, then there's a lot of synergies that you find. And you just eke out what you know from the technology. We are a team of 30 experts in ultrasound and how to apply it. And we've got a really strong commercial team that help to make that conversation palatable to the customers who want to buy it. Mm. And, and how important is that split? Because we do talk to whether it be um, in the space industry or, or health tech or whatever it may be, when it's a very detailed technology, you, you tend to get the people that are very much on the tech side. And then you're, as you're saying, need someone to, to bring it to life and, and commercialize it. So how important has that split been for you? No, absolutely. I mean, at the start of a early stage company, uh, it's a very technical sale because if it wasn't technical, everybody would else already know what you're selling. So therefore, uh, there wouldn't be a startup to be had because it's been done before. So in my role at Novasound, I was an academic for about 15 years in a university and I invented a way of making ultrasound sensors much easier, much more commercially viable. So we spun out of the university and I was, you know, physicist by training, no, uh, no business experience, didn't know my P&Ls or anything. And I linked up with a mentor who came on to basically teach me how to do business. He'd done a spin out right up to exit, very successful exit before. And through that, we uh, created a business plan, raised investment. But right from the get go, everybody's a salesman. So myself coming out of the academic world as a lecturer, having to learn how to actually talk about the why of the tech rather than just what it is. And that, that's one of the critical things to understand when making the change from being a academic or a tech person, people don't buy tech just because what it is, because you know the what is just what you do is your bread and butter. The why is really connecting it to value so you can actually put a price on it that's not just the cost. So those that was the first big learning that I got about how you actually convince people to buy something based on what uh, the, the why of, of why it exists rather than just what it is. And you know, as I say, ultrasound is very common in hospitals. So if you come out of the bat, with a new ultrasound company, people kind of go, so what? You know, we've got ultrasound. You have to get into why this is different, why it's got value, and you know what problems it solves. So you know that that that's really the, the critical bit of selling is uh, getting your head out of pure tech and getting to the why. Some people can do it really well, uh, other people can't. <laughs> I mm. think that's it. But yeah, everyone's a salesman, so you just have to kind of tap into that side of your brain. Mm. And, and it sounds like bringing that mentor on, on board was a, a big step before you were in a position to actually employ the, the commercially minded mm-hmm. side of the business. So h- how did you go about that? How did you find the right mentor for the business? So when, when I was inside the university, there was, and we were in a Scottish university, there's lots of public support in Scotland for creating spin out companies. And I was lucky to receive a sizable grant from Scottish Enterprise to flesh out a business plan and through that I could hire uh, what's known as a commercial champion someone who's done the the journey before and we uh, advertised uh, found people interviewed a lot of people but the one criteria that I wanted was somebody that would come into the business with me outside the university so it wasn't just a, a cash grab effect but it was somebody that uh, actually believes in the business enough to say I want to be the CEO of this business when it emerges so I met Richard Richard Cooper my co-founder and we just clicked right away, really. And uh, as I said, he went from a 13-year journey from a spin-out from another university right up to selling to a major blue-chip company, did very well, but didn't like the blue-chip lifestyle, wanted to start the journey again, introduced to me. And 
basically joined 24-7 at the hip at that point. I was mm. still lecturing and doing all my academic day job, but the kind of call of the wild of becoming an entrepreneur was too strong. I ended up thinking I'm going to be spinning out a company by hook or by crook. And uh, that, that kind of really transformed my life, to, to be honest, and actually see how you go from just writing papers that nobody's going to read to actually building tech that people are going to use to solve problems and uh, make the world a safer place. So so really that that was the, the main thing of finding the right person who's committed, as committed as yourself. As a tech founder, mm. it's rare to find somebody who is as committed as you because it's your, it's your invention, your uh, technology, your baby. But mm. if you can find somebody who you connect with, then it, it makes it so much easier. Yeah, so it sounds like you went through the sort of key steps of bringing the right team on board, putting the plan together, bringing on the investment. Um, you've then got the the massive challenge of once you've actually got the tech of how to sell it into into yeah. some of these industries. And, and you've talked about the the why being so important, but t- tell me what it's like and, and the sort of strategies used to get into, say, the aviation industry or the oil and gas industry. Yeah, so well, as focus on aviation because we've had a lot of success over the last 12 months in that industry so aviation is a very highly regulated industry safety is critical we've seen all the disasters you know when it, when it goes wrong and you know just a few weeks ago there was the plane that started falling apart over denver when you see the pictures on bbc news of the engine and flames luckily nobody was hurt at that but that's exactly the area that ultrasound is used in aviation they need a space to detect these metal fatigue problems however it's hard to get in as a startup. Uh, you know, there's loads of blades, uh, turbine blades in every engine, and you want to be able to sell to to all of, to to inspect all of them. But because it's so regulated, you have to go to the top of the tree. So you have to really understand the hierarchy of the industry, and that's the same across oil and gas, mm. healthcare. You don't sell to a doctor, you sell to a healthcare trust, or you sell to procurement, etc. Um, and av- aviation is very similar. So there's maybe four or five manufacturers of engines, let's say, and if you sell to the tier one manufacturer that anybody who has to do maintenance and inspection of these engines anywhere in the world has to use the tools that the manufacturer mm-hmm. says so at Novasound, what we've learned uh, over the last 12 months is you sell to that person at the top you sell to that company and we've been very successful there and it, then you might get five figures six figures of revenue from that one customer but because of the way the industry works you if, if the other uh, MRO maintenance repair and overhaul shops around the world have to inspect those engines, they have to come to Nova Sound to buy the probes in order to do the inspection. So then you're getting four figures, five figures mm. from multiple places and you grow a global business. You do not get taught that <laughs> back at entrepreneur school if you're an entrepreneur or an academic because you get taught how to do a one minute pitch to convey your idea. You don't get into the nitty gritty of how you actually segment a, the hierarchy of the market mm. you're selling to. But it's absolutely critical to not only understand the tech of what you're selling, you know, coming back to this what versus why, but who who it is that you're actually selling to. So the best, fastest car, that's just what it is. You have to understand why that is important to the person you're trying to sell to. And, and I assume it, it's similar when um, looking at investment as well and bringing on new investors. So I, I assume the, the original investment was really to produce the tech and, and build the the start in the founding team, if you like. So, so what are the goals for the business now in terms of investment? Yeah, so we started April 18. That was our seed round investment. We did that in Scotland with the Angel Syndicate Network. And that was, there was, there was a really healthy environment in Scotland for Angel investment at the moment. That helped us get out of the university. But the university grant that we had was proof of concept, proof of company. So we came out of it with a business plan and prototype tech that was patented. That seed round was basically take us from six people up to 30, <laughs> you know, and really we had the tech, we had the team and the timing was with us at that point, won some really good awards and prizes. December 2019, we closed our series A round and that was a VC round. So we jumped from angel up to VC and, you know, never underestimate how much of a culture shift that actually is, especially for a, in a two year period. So December 19, we closed our series A and that was meant to be our the kickoff of our year of growth through 2020, you know, uh, growing a startup, high growth company in oil and gas and aerospace during 2020 from January and February, it looked really rosy. And then obviously in, mm. in March, uh, lockdown happened and the first industries that really got hit by it was the aviation when planes weren't flying and the oil and gas industry was still reeling from the negative oil price. So it was a very challenging environment. So now we managed to get through it because of closing the deal 
our main uh, challenge now is to get back on the back on the track really with the, the, the products that we have. We've had an extra 12 months to develop our products, which is great. It's all about revenue growth to actually get the product market fit proved now in the commercial track should demonstrate it and show that uh, we've got business to take to the next level. Mm. And, and how did you manage that? So obviously a, a massive shift over the last year with, with the pandemic and, and everything you've mentioned. How did you manage that with the people that had invested in the business yeah. um, who obviously understand there's a massive <laughs> shift, but how do you manage their expectations during a time like that? Exactly. It's about communication, constant, frequent communication and, and very frank communication as well. We went from having you know, our six weekly to six weekly board meetings to like weekly board meetings back through March, April, May, really just trying to look at what this what, what's going to happen to this business. As I say, we worked in oil and gas and aerospace. Luckily, we weren't consumer, we weren't in hospitality, we weren't in a, a business with a 16-week cash flow that disappears to two weeks overnight. That was not us. We were all very we we're all very aware of the fact that we closed that sizable, you know, it was 3.3 million pound investment round in December. And you know, we were what's known as cash rich effectively at the time so but that money is for growth it's not for survival you know in in a startup you don't you know you could put the brakes on and last 10 years on three million pounds but you wouldn't go anywhere with it the investors need to see an increase in value so the conversation very quickly turned away from saying right how are we going to get sales 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 the market doors were closed we turned it around and said well we've got manufacturing business we've got team of engineers physicists designers mechanical engineers how can we grow value in the business without revenue? And that's all about tech, IP, brand, digital marketing. So we t- basically everybody went remote for two months. Uh, luckily, the way the business is structured, we could do that easily. And we redesigned our products based on all the feedback we'd had from customers up to that point. We weren't getting bothered by going out to trade shows or having to do customer visits. So we could really just kind of put a big mind map down of all the feedback we've had to make the product better for when the world opened. And that's where we're kind of sitting now. We did a big product launch in October of the redesigned new value proposition. We really understood the why a lot better. And now it's really just capitalizing and growing the revenues off the back of that. And that stakeholder management and um, just expectation management is so important, I suppose, not just because these people are important to the business and have invested, but I suppose you've got to keep them in mind for future rounds as well. Um, So so what advice do you have for people generally on on stakeholder management and and keeping the, the investors engaged? It's very much about, as I say, open, frank discussion of uh, where you want to go and really one, you know, I'm a physicist, I'm a scientist at heart, so data and validated data and reasoning behind decisions, uh, because a lot of the time your investors or your stakeholders won't have the same background as you, because again, if people had the same background as you, your business idea would already be done. So you really need to have to come in credibly clear and just be with communication that's frank and open to, to allow them to continue to believe that you're the right person to steer through, you know, the, the choppy waters. And you can't do that if you're only speaking to them every four weeks. So, you know, pick up the phone, have a verbal, not just email, go to phone calls, go to video calls and just pe- not pester them, but become more, uh, you know, they, they're as much ingrained in it as you are. You know, if I, I'm very aware that, yeah, I've got great tech and, you know, I know what I'm doing with my tech, but the, I would not be able to do Novasound to this level without my stakeholders, without my shareholders, my investors or the team around me. So really being open and transparent with them as to why we're making these decisions, you know, good and bad decisions, for example. Mm. And, uh, you know, it, 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 I, I definitely see business, if, if I had to describe it as one thing, it's an open, it's an open con- ongoing con- conversation. That, that's all business is. And, you know, you have good conversations, bad conversations, but as long as the conversation is there, you'll keep moving forward. Mm, that's, a, that's some good advice and it, it certainly sounds like a lot's changed in the the couple of years that you, you've been running the business in terms of going through the development actually breaking into some of these massive industries so how, how's that affected your role as the founder how, how's your role evolved over time yeah so when we did the april 18 seed round i was leaving the university and i was the technical director i was the cto founder cto which is you know, the, the definition of CTO is a lot of the time number two in terms of the employee number two. And my co-founder, the experienced business guy, he was the CEO. He was part-time and I was full-time and they really needed to see commitment from the guy, the technical guy to be in this tech business. So that was fine. And so I left the university, became the technical director. And then we built up the team around me and I was doing much more CEO role and technical director jobs. And I'd kind of built enough of a tech team that that meant the wheels weren't spinning 
eventually. And two major kind of things happened over the last 12 months. In the summertime, we brought a new chairperson and we got an industrial heavy hitter roof joined by a guy called Derek Matheson, joined as the chair of our board. And he actually came to us from Baker Hughes. And Baker Hughes is one of the biggest energy services, com- oil field services companies in the world where he was the technical director there. And then all of a sudden he's the chairman of my business. And I'm like, that's pretty good for a, a two and a half year old company to get somebody of that magnitude, global magnitude. And then the conversation very turned, very much turned to my position. And the time was kind of right to make me the transition from CTO to CEO. So in November, six months ago now, uh, I made the transition up to the CEO, which I couldn't really say that my day-to-day role has changed that much at that point because I was effectively doing a lot as a technical founder or technical CTO founder Mm. you're merging the technical strategy and the commercial roadmap always you know if 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 these diverge at any point in the early stage of a technical startup you're going to fail you know you have to make sure that what the tech is developing towards is what you're selling you can't have any ambiguity there so that was my role as a CTO and I'm continuing that as a very technical focus CEO, but with a lot of the three years now, next week's our third birthday experience of what the business actually needs to do commercially. So as a CEO, my role's fairly high pressure now. You know, it's not just tech, it's the, the, the kind of business on my shoulders, but it's in the right direction. It's the right move to make for the business. Mm, sounds like a, a lot's changed and it sounds like you're now in a, a great position to really go out and push this into various marketplaces so what what are the big goals then for the business uh over the next year and, and sort of five years or so yeah so i mean five years we're always talking exit you know if every startup will tell you three to five year exit that, that's the big goal but we're now three years into that five-year plan so that that's definitely one of our big uh, returns is is where we're aiming for we are looking that the business at the moment is a sensors business. We sell sensors and we sell instrumentation. And it's a hardware product, which is you know, different from a normal tech company. It may just be software. So what we are looking to do now is to grow the business in a fair, I can't say much at the moment about it because we're still gearing up where, where it's going. But with the budget just being approved last week for the year ahead, there's going to be quite a seismic shift in the messaging from Novasound being just you know hardware sensors to the big play, which is data. And I'm really excited about where we're going with that. I've just posted our first job advert in that direction. So uh, definitely uh, we're looking at getting into the whole recurring revenue uh, data mm-hmm. that data provides and really move us from being a traditional hardware sensors company to something really special and in a way that can cover our key markets of energy, power, gen, aerospace and healthcare, which when you add all those markets together, which are not small markets, you make a very sizable almost dare I say uni- unicorn sized business out of Scotland and that's my ambition it has to be said and uh, really we've kind of I think a lot of the changes that COVID has brought along isn't that we're doing something completely different I'm not calling it a pivot it's absolutely not a pivot it's additive to what we were doing mm. but COVID pandemic has really accelerated the adoption of remote technologies and remote monitoring and remote inspection and wearable healthcare and that's really in our wheelhouse of what we do at Novasound so next five-year goals I'd expect to be almost like a data company rather than being a sensors company that's where we're going yeah sounds like a, an exciting time so for for those listening then where can they find out more about novo sound so people uh, <laughs> they they mock me to an extent because their linkedin page is very very active so the nova sound uh, go to linkedin search for nova sound and you'll find our linkedin page there the usual website www.novasound.net and i'm on twitter uh, as personal uh, Dave Hughes megahertz MHZ that is Dave Hughes MHZ is my personal Twitter handle which I'm fairly active there so if you want to follow the journey of Novasound that those are the best places to go but really just uh, just LinkedIn Twitter and the website is the main places to go and hopefully you know mainstream media if we do this right so we'll see.